Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is the story of someone getting back at someone with revenge after being wronged. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. My father is annoyed by the constant visits of Jehovah's Witnesses, so he decided to talk to them. The second story. The bucket woman lost her tenants because she gave me problems. The third story. I returned all the property of the company after they fired me. The first story is, turnabout is fair play. Jehovah's Witnesses can be annoying to deal with. My in-laws will turn off the lights and hide in the back rooms to avoid them. Other responses I've heard of vary anywhere from slam doors to yelling and screaming. For the most part, the only impoliteness comes from the attempted converts, not the Jehovah's Witnesses themselves. If you're trying to spread your beliefs and grow your church, being cruel or even impolite is a poor way to do it. Thus, most Jehovah's Witnesses are both eager to please and polite to a fault, all in the hopes that you'll listen long enough to join up. In the other corner is my dad. I've never met anyone as calm as my dad. Someone can be screaming in his face and he'll just calmly stare back, with just a hint of a smile on his face, and still try to logically argue his point. He has a very logical mind and absorbs facts through study with ease, as long as it's something he's interested in. Now, my dad is a Christian, as am I, He's read his Bible cover to cover dozens of times and could readily hold his own in debates with the greatest religious minds. He's willing to discuss scripture with anyone who asks. A few months prior, mom had answered the door to a couple of pushy Jehovah's Witnesses. They left their literature and promised to come back. I guess they thought mom was an easy mark. Huh. <laughs> Dad worked afternoons, so he wasn't home at the time. Several neighbors complained about the pushy attitude and how these specific Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't take no for an answer, wasting their time. In fact, during Sunday school, Dad and a friend of his discussed the Jehovah's Witnesses and that they would really like to talk with them and set them straight. One fine June morning about 9 a.m., we got a knock at our door. Dad answered and to his delight it was the two Jehovah's Witnesses. And so began the slow revenge. He invited them in, saying that he was really pleased to see them. They sat down and Dad began to discuss Jehovah and the Bible with them. At first he played the fool, offering easy targets for the Jehovah's Witnesses to shoot down or agree with. I was watching from the relative safety of the other room, but I could see the eager expressions on their faces. This could be a new convert, an easy mark. As time wore on, their faces grew less and less eager. As Dad moved into discussing points in their doctrine, they began edging towards the door. As they stood, Dad stood. He made no move to open the door for them, however, and continued asking them questions. Unwilling to shove past him, they merely stood and answered, hoping that maybe this would lead somewhere. Time wore on. Bored with the conversation, I went outside to climb a tree in our front yard. Another pair of Jehovah's Witnesses walked down the road from the north and got into the big van parked in our driveway, then another set from the south. We live out in the country, so they must have trucked three pairs together to cover more ground in less time. More fool them. No one was going anywhere today. Our road had a fair number of lot of houses on it, but it's surrounded by fields, so the other Jehovah's Witnesses had nowhere to go. After an hour and a half, the two men inside had heard enough and managed to push past Dad to the door. Dad was perfectly fine with that. It was a beautiful day outside and he could finish his point outside. The two men, visibly pale and unable to leave our porch, realized they would not be able to leave without actually saying it. One interrupted my dad to say goodbye. Unfortunately, his word choice was open to interpretation, and Dad started in on the end times and how it pertained to their beliefs. The two men stared at each other, fear and frustration in their eyes, then turned and fast walked to their van. Dad followed, climbed into their van, introduced himself to the other Jehovah's Witnesses there, and continued his discussion for another hour. Finally, one of the men physically dragged him out of the van, slammed the door shut, and leaped back in as they peeled out and roared away, two and a half hours after they arrived. The cherry on top was a conversation just a few days later, though. One of my dad's friends called him. He lived a few miles up the road from us. He hadn't heard about what had happened, and while he too enjoyed long discussions, he had a legitimate appointment he had to get to. However, he mentioned that he had a friend who would love to talk with them. Their faces lit up. They needed a win. He wrote down our address and handed it to the men. Their faces went from joy to stark fear, and they immediately said their goodbyes, fled for their van and raced away, leaving my dad's friend scratching his head. As far as I know, the Jehovah's Witnesses have never visited either neighborhood again. Great job. I understand you, OP, and I understand how annoying it is. When I was a teenager, we had very frequent visits from Jehovah's Witnesses, at least once a month. As a little a-hole, I thought of different prank scenarios, but the only one I applied was trying to convert them to the Church of Satan. That didn't go over well. 
I've since learned from a friend who is in their ranks that they are constantly being pranked, and they are taught to thank you politely for your time and move on. Now that I'm grown, I always tell them I'm a Satanist. I explain that I don't care about hell, that Satan himself sent me an injunction forbidding me to go any closer than 10,000 miles to him. Usually scares them off. Usually they don't stay long after that, and I wouldn't let them in my house. They might decide to come back and do an exorcism or something. Haha, <laughs> that would be both fun and scary. The second story is... Neighborhood dispute started over grass and bins. Ends with her tenants leaving. My kids and I move house in March. Day two in my new house and I tripped over a broken paver. Didn't break anything but I still needed surgery, a three night hospital stay, and a full leg brace for two weeks. While I was in hospital my partner, formerly ex-partner, now reconciled, it's complicated. Martin, dad, sister, bestie and her wife had formed an emergency team. They kept my kids and pets safe and fed, and finished the unpacking. Dad and Martin did a little garden work, removing the broken paver and laying some old fence posts along the fence, where next door's dog was digging through. Week one I hobbled to the letterbox and met next door's landlord, who my partner is nicknamed the Bucket Woman. She immediately told me to bring my bins in by 9am because it made the street look messy. She demanded I move the posts because the grass would grow through to her side. I explained the reason for the posts and said that once the holes were filled in, let me know and I would move them, and hello to you too. Week 1, Ben Day, 9-10 AM. The bucket woman banged on my door. I'm still in PJs and a leg brace. She complained about the bins. I said my bestie is coming by later to help me dress. I couldn't do feet. I'd bring the bins in later. When bestie pulled up, she had to park out front because my bins were in the driveway. I checked. The council bylaws don't have a deadline for bringing bins in. Next, Martin got temporary approval to WFH at my place. I got home and Martin was escorting the bucket woman off the property. The bucket woman thought nobody was home and tried to sneak in and move the posts. Martin said next time he calls the police. A few weeks ago the police arrived, Martin was at work, and said a concerned neighbor called about a man and woman having a domestic dispute and the man was destroying the fence. The bucket woman is out the front watching. Once they're satisfied I'm okay and there's no damage, I explain about last week and show them security footage. Later I see them speaking with the bucket woman. She isn't happy and goes inside. I was working nights, and the police visit had taken up a lot of my precious sleeping time. I was fuming. Then the penny dropped. The bucket woman just let herself in while the tenants were at work, so I spoke to the tenants and I was blunt. I asked if they were okay with the bucket woman being in the house while they were out, and said I'd seen her there at least once a week. In a nutshell, they were not okay with that. Later one of the guys came around with a box of chalkies, thanked me and said they were moving out right away. The bucket woman was furious at me. She says I made her tenants leave and got her in trouble with the rental agents too. She told me I made the street look messy and hang underwear on the washing line, so how will she get new tenants? I wanted to tell her so badly to get off my lawn. Update. I just got off the phone from the council. Someone has complained I removed a protected tree from my property. Oh, I'm gonna enjoy this. Update 2. Spoke to the council again. The complaint is definitely that the tree was removed. The tree is definitely still there and visible from the street. Counselor sending someone to inspect the tree. Martin and I will be there, armed with reports and photographs. I did my bit for democracy, and the nice neighbors from the other side were in the queue to vote ahead of me. They took their own photos of the storm damage to the tree, and OMG it was way scarier from their side of the fence. I've added their photos to the file. Next door don't have any problems with the bucket woman trespassing, but he's retired and she works from home. The bloke hates her guts and is happy to keep an eye on our backyard when we're out. You gave her the heat, OP. Proud of you. That seems like a crazy lady. I think special service should be called because it's not okay to go into someone's home without permission. My crazy neighbor demanded that I paint the outside of my house when I was figuring out how to make the repairs he needed, so I could just move in. I hope you get to paint the outside soon. It makes the block look really bad. Then I told him, I plan on living inside, not outside, so it's not a priority. The next day there was a volcanic eruption. All the ash blew down on us. Every house and road had to be washed with water. Our block of houses was especially bad. Everyone had to be repainted. It had been painted for three months before that. The day after that. Me. Wow, that ash was really bad. It's a good thing I didn't spend the money to paint, since I'll have to paint again. Now she hardly ever talks to me, other than demonstrating basic manners. The last story is... Since you're going to be petty. This is a story from my past when the markets were tanking about a decade ago. I worked for a small company, less than 12 people, headquartered in a northeastern US city about 4 hours from my home. I was employed for over a year, 
and we definitely had our struggles as we were a small startup that had a lot of politics. I became sick with cancer that fall, and my surgery and treatment ended on December 31st, as I was determined not to go into the new year with this burden. I was given 10 days into the new year to return to work, as I would be fully recovered. I had to provide a doctor's note to both my employer and insurance company. I was on temp disability, that I was fit to return to work. I work remotely from home, and I was the only employee to do so. It was treated as a bonus by my management team. This becomes important as I was required to be in the HQ every Thursday for an 8am team meeting, but I was not allowed to book a hotel. They fought my travel expenses every month down to the mile. Once my expenses were rejected as I added 5 miles to their web map, as I needed to justify my need to get gas, and my departure from the highway. I mistakenly submitted actual mileage. They trained me well. I started each Thursday at 3 a.m. driving to make the team meeting, and was required to work the full day, which meant a departure after 6 p.m. So one workday each was 3 a.m. to 11 p.m., depending on traffic. It was not fun, but there was going to be a significant upside that would have made it worthwhile. I was laid off while at the doctor's office getting my note. I was surprised to check my Blackberry. Yes, it was a long time ago, with an email that read simply, as the group has failed to live up to the expectations we had, we've decided to close your team and group. You have 48 hours to return all company property. I should add that no one from management ever actually checked in or asked how I was doing either during my treatment or after. I was pretty angered by this email, as we grew the company's revenue by over 31% year over year. The email made me actually read my guidelines for employment, and I found out that I only had to make the equipment available to them, and I replied simply that they were welcome to come pick up the equipment. PC, monitor, etc. But I required 48 hours notice, and I would require them to arrive and depart during business hours. I was told I was being petty. I had months of expenses awaiting reimbursement, which equated to thousands that I had little faith that they would be paid to me, as they were submitted before my treatment. They informed me that if I mailed back all supplies, they would pay it all along with my outstanding expenses. I didn't trust them and told them that if they made arrangements at one of three possible locations, their choice, I would drop off the equipment but they would pay all shipping and packaging costs directly to the service provider. I delivered every packing box, notebook, business card, monitor, and laptop. Anything I had ever touched of theirs with the explicit instructions, that as I had been threatened several times with failure to comply, warnings in their follow on emails about the condition of each item. I photographed every item. Apparently they were not very nice to the parking store either, as they made an impression in just arranging the service. The store employees shared this with me while I unloaded the car. I watched them bubble wrap empty boxes, and carefully place those boxes inside larger boxes. Lesson learned, it pays to read terms of employment, and just be a genuinely nice person. I know how you could improve your revenge, send each empty box separately to increase their value. They get a bill for each box and you enjoy your revenge, but what you've done may cause them more problems. They need to open boxes, unwrap other boxes and then open those boxes in case there's something inside. Thank you for watching, subscribe, hit the like button and have a good day.